This is November 6, 2001. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. And we are privileged to have with us today Adolfo Caso. Welcome, Adolfo. Good morning. Am I saying your name properly here? Yes. Okay, yes, I did. fine. May I ask you when you were born? January 7, 1934. And what is your current address? Western Massachusetts. And your marital status? I'm married, three children, and uh, five grandchildren. No great grandchildren at this point Not yet. yet? No. Where were you born? I was born in Italy, midways between the east and the western coast of uh, Naples, midway right at the center of, uh, of Italy. And were you raised there? Before we began this tape, you told us about some uh, oddities in the way you were brought up and where you were born and where your dad was. Yes. Can you quickly tell us about that? Well, our uh, history is one, is a history of immigrants. Um, my grandfather came to America in 1890. And then uh, um, afterwards, he brought his uh, uh, first son. His name was Raffaele, who is, was my father and as well as uh, his other son, Gasper. And uh, what happened is that they went back and forth between Italy and, um, and Naples, Italy, uh, because they never brought their families over to America. So the, uh, the, the male, the father, uh, would come uh, across the ocean, come here, make whatever money, then would go back and, and raise the family in Italy. So my father was one who came in 1904 and uh, traveled uh, back and forth. And every time that he would go back uh, to Italy, he would have a child, and then he'd come back. And then um, once again, he would go to, uh, back to Italy. And as, he, uh, as the children grew older, he would bring them over one at a time. So my, my brother and two sisters came here with him long before I was able to come. Um, we were scheduled to come in 1939-40. The war broke out, and uh, my mother, my other sister, and myself were left uh, in Italy, while my father, brother, and two sisters were uh, in America. I was born uh, long after my brother had uh, come to America, and my sisters were here. And because my father left just after I was born, I didn't meet my father nor my brother until after we came to America in 1947. So you were born in 1934, and the war broke out in 1939 39, in 40, yes. Uh, and your dad then was over in the United States? Yes, he was in Boston. So what did your mother do about this? Well, my mother is the real hero in this whole uh, story because uh, we had one plot of land, and a, uh, but we didn't have a, a house. We lived with my grandparents. And my mother's job was to procure for uh, my sister and for me. Uh, so she worked the land, and we had uh, well, a little farm. We raised uh, animals, pigs, chickens, whatever. And we lived for all those years uh, on my mother's work because she tilled the land. She got our vegetables, the bread, and so on and so forth. But it is true also that during the war, uh, um, several things or many things were taken from us, or we were not able to raise, for instance, the food. And there were times when we did not have any food, even though we had our own uh, small farm. So the war was very um, harsh on us, but not as harsh as, as it was on other people who did not have a piece of land. But my mother is the one who diligently worked uh, every day and uh, got us meals on a regular basis uh, and she is the, really the unsung hero in our family, a woman who never went to school, did not know how to read and write, and yet she was so intelligent, with native intelligence, that she was able to maintain a family almost uh, in, in Italy as well as in America, but certainly in Italy she is the one who took care of me and took care of my sister, and also of, uh, he, she took care of our, our grandparents. As we said a minute ago, um, you were five when the war broke out in Europe. It broke out in the fall of uh, 39. Yes. Um, 
when were you first conscious of the fact that you're a kid growing up and there's something called a war going on? Or, or f further than that, have you recollections of a man named Benito Mussolini? I have great recollections of that, and I would like to say a few things about that. Uh, I do not know the exact age, but I must have been probably four or five when um, I saw with my own eyes uh, the impending war coming. And it took place uh, in my village, and the form was very unusual. These um, um, soldiers came to the village in a uniform, and they paraded through, through the village. When I saw the soldiers for the first time parading, I said, well, something is happening because we had never seen uh, them before. And these were Italian soldiers. And by the way, that was the last time that I ever saw a um, uniformed Italian soldiers uh, in any kind of formation. That was the only time. But thereafter, um, other soldiers came who were really not in uniform, but they were spokesmen for the government of, it of Italy, of uh, Benito Mussolini. They came to the village looking for uh, steel, for iron, for copper, for all these kinds of things, and as well as, as gold. And they asked the villagers to bring all of the, these items to them at their headquarters, which was a temporary headquarters, and, um, and actually almost forced the villagers to do that. And what they took were pots and pans that were made of, of uh, copper and uh, as well as other things. And then the stupidity of the whole thing was that the pots and pans that were not copper, that were useless to them, instead of giving them back to us uh, in, uh, in whole pieces, they would put a hole in the middle of it at the bottom so that we could not even use them. And I remember that distinctly as a boy. And I asked myself, this has to be something wrong with what is going on, because these people had no reason to do what they did, and yet they did that. The other thing that I realized as a child was that how can there be a war and Italy be part of this war, and they wouldn't have the resources to produce bullets, that they have to come to these villages uh, and get pots and pans in order to uh, have the material um, needed to fight a war. So that is the first time that I realized that things were happening and that things were not going to happen in the right way, as, well as uh, and the results show that, of course, it did not. Can you put a, a date on Italy's experience in Ethiopia? Was this before? It, Ethiopia was long before um, I was born. Ethiopia so many, was. Many of the bullets you were looking for probably went way east into uh, Africa. Uh, probably the bullets that were being um, um, looked for or manufactured were for the new war that Italy was uh, being engaged on the side of, uh, of Germany and of uh, Japan. So the Ethiopia had already um, happened uh, as well as um, other places because Italy under Mussolini wanted, wanted to recreate the Roman Empire. This is the folly of wanting to uh, resuscitate. This something. is the Western Mare, is that yes. the RC, the, the Mediterranean? Yes. I, I was thinking last night of um, going way, way back that our President Roosevelt, at the time that Italy declared war on, on France, Yes. Um, he used the phrase that hand the hell the dagger has stuck it into the back of its neighbor. Yes. Well. That, that truly is, some, is something that is inimical to me, uh, to think that, that Italy was always, in spite of the fact that they had problems, friends with, um, uh, friends with France. Uh, and of course, they were on the side, um, and France was on the side of England. And, but the war had not been declared. To me, the, the worst thing that Italy did was to declare war on the United States. I could understand perhaps France, even though I did not accept it. But to declare war on, on, uh, on the United States is, has, a, uh, has a different dimension. And the dimension is that in New York alone, there were more Italians and Americans of Italian descent than there were in Rome, for goodness sakes. 
And for a, a man, a leader of a nation and a nation to declare war on another nation that had nothing, that had done nothing to you, other than to take your your uh, people that were deprived of, of a decent living, and took them and uh, gave them a future, and then you turn around and you declare a war because you're an ally of Hitler. The, in other words, that never made sense, still does not make sense, and no matter how many explanations we have about it, uh, it truly is something that lives, especially in my soul, and the soul of many other Americans of Italian descent. That to me was the great be betrayal, because uh, by doing what Mussolini did, betrayed further his own people. Can you <clears throat> tell us what personally you saw of the war in Italy? Say again? Personally, as a boy, pretty young boy, uh, w did you see personally any of the war yes, uh, in uh, and around Naples or that? No, I saw the, uh, at least the, the war for uh, at least three years. Uh, I saw the, wa the war uh, from the air uh, when the Americans were in North Africa. Uh, so when the American and the English were in North Africa before they invaded Sicily, uh, they were obviously sending their airplanes uh, north uh, to destroy uh, German, uh, well, they were only German um, uh, units. Tell us what you saw. So yeah. on a regular basis or, and on a daily basis, we would see huge formations of uh, these bomber planes, the large planes, surrounded by uh, smaller planes. Now we know uh, who they were. The, the, they were the, the pilots, or, uh, f fighter pilots, who were protecting them. And I would see fights almost on a daily basis uh, between these bombers that were pen penetrating, uh, going to north, uh, being surrounded by these fighter pilots, and then they would be attacked by either Italian or by uh, German planes. But for the most part, they were attacked by German planes. Where were you when you were watching? And I was this? there at my house. I was looking at them in the o in the open fields. You know, and it was a. I simply would look up into the sky, and there they were. And I would follow all the battles uh, that were taking place on a. And um, very often the uh, the planes especially the German planes, would be shot down. I never saw one American plane being shot down, but I saw many of the German planes. And the German planes were trying to penetrate the perimeter defense of um, uh, these bombers and were never able to penetrate. Later on, uh, in, in the 80s, when I, came, when I was an American doing some studies, I learned for the first time that what I saw were the Tuskegee Airmen who were responsible for the perimeter defense of these formations, discovered that, that what I saw, and now I was able to collaborate and corroborate the fact that the Tuskegee Airmen were the ones who were defending the, the bombers and uh, defending them uh, in such a degree that they were never able, the, uh, the Germans were never able to penetrate those formations. I think that's true that the, uh, those Tuskegee Airmen were black Airmen in yes. T-51s, the latest pursuits. That's correct. They took pride in the fact that they never lost a bomber under their care. That's correct, yeah. And, and I you was were watching them. And I actually watched them on a regular basis, of course, not knowing uh, who they were or, or who, who it was. All I know is uh, that, and I can vouch for it, is that um, the Germans never were able to penetrate that defense. Did your mother and the other people in the village you know, where you lived. Talk about the war and its progress and Italy's part in it. Never, actually, because the, we were living the war, so we, we never talked about it. We didn't know the outcome. We actually didn't know, in a way, who it was that was fighting other than the Americans uh, were, were coming and the English were coming. But we did not know until it happened. For instance, we, we saw uh, soldiers from Morocco for the first time. We saw black soldiers for the first time. I had never seen a black man. I had never seen a Japanese person. And we saw Japanese because there, there were uh, units that fought uh, in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, we were quite isolated and really did not know much about the outside world other than what, what was happening in the village. So what I'm able to tell is only that which we saw, or I saw, in the village. So I did see the, um, the planes, obviously, and, and the uh, fighter pilots, 
And also I saw from about 50 miles away the invasion of Salerno. Now the Salerno invasion was truly the, one of the bigger battles, if not the biggest battle, uh, in Europe at that time. And being 50 miles away, I still remember the, um, the attack on the port of uh, Salerno. And the, the whole night was nothing but, but huge big flares and explosions that I was able to see and hear the explosions about 50 miles away. And it is the first time that I had a concept of hell. When I saw all of that, I said, well, that's what hell must be. And then to top it off that evening or that night, unbeknown to us, we, he we heard a huge big explosion about two miles away from my home. And it was the bridge that had been blown by the Germans as they were retreating. And the combination of that huge uh, explosion plus what we saw and heard from far away, um, in my mind, I, I created an idea of what hell was like, and that was it. Did you, <coughs> or the, <coughs> excuse me, the people around you have a feeling of the Italians were losing this war, or their aspect of it, they get up to Casino and Anzio, and then Mark Clark came along and took Rome. Yes. Um, and then the Germans uh, took over many of the positions previously held by the Italians. Yes. What was the reaction of you well, folks on the ground? First of all, as I said, we never saw an, a, a, a formation of any Italian soldiers. Only the, the, the first one that I saw was when they had came, came to the village before the war. So we never saw any Italian soldiers at all, other than those who were called up, were given uniform, and they were inducted into the, into the army. But what we saw on a regular basis were only German forces. And the German forces that we saw were huge. We, we could believe the, um, the, the tanks that went down the, the, the road in front of my house, numberless uh, tanks, um, um, aircraft, uh, all kinds of, all kinds of um, munitions, ammunition, soldiers, uh, for days on out um, moving along. And there were all forces that were going to uh, try to repair against the oncoming Americans uh, who were coming from uh, on the Salerno side of, um, of the peninsula. And I remember distinctly how many columns of artillery, uh, tanks, uh, infantry, they all passed my, by my village. How did the Germans treat you folks? The Germans were completely aloof. They, they, uh, they had a, a goal, and the goal was to drive the tank, or to drive the truck, or to, or to march. They did, had nothing to do with us whatsoever, nothing. And I remember them moving down, as I, and I said to myself, my gosh, I don't see a, a human face on anything. They were always very somber, very strict, uh, with the helmets on. They reminded me of, of uh, soldiers from out of, out of space, never a smile, always serious <coughs> and down, as though uh, these uh, vehicles, these armaments, were not driven by human beings, by, by automatons, by people that were not people. This is how I remember seeing them. How old were you now? You're getting to be... Now about seven, seven six, or eight seven years, years old. old yeah. yeah. And the other thing, too, about um, my, um, my life uh, during the war is that I did complete the first grade because the war hadn't started. And then as, we, as I entered into the second grade, I think we were in a month into it, when the war broke, broke out and there were already attacks um, in, from North Africa and all. And the schools did stop. And stop didn't uh, start again until after the war. So I missed all of those years because there, were no, there was no school. So I went to the first grade uh, in Italy. And then <coughs> when I came to America, I entered the sixth grade. So I, I skipped <laughs> the second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. Was your mother trying to teach you at home? Well, she couldn't because yeah. she didn't know how to read and write herself. No, there were no, no such things. The, the only preoccupation was to survive. And we survived, whereas other people did not. There were many people who were killed 
families, nearby families were killed by bombs that were, were dropped. Remember, <coughs> there, we had all of these German um, uh, forces in the village or going through the village, or, and at times they would stop in the village. And, and uh, literally, they were wonderful targets for uh, airplanes. And so we received the attacks from the air, aimed at the Germans, but very often, not one German was killed, except for maybe two or three inc uh, incidences. But often, it were the civilians who were, who were killed. Yeah. We did, were. Did you tell us the name of your village? Yes, Paso Eclano. Paso Oclano. Paso Eclano, yeah. And this was large enough to accommodate this passage of troops going through. See, the, we, I lived on, on the main road that connected Foggia, which is the eastern part of the boot, to Naples, the western part. And that was the main highway, the only highway, that connected the two oh, coasts. Yeah. So the Germans would come down on the eastern part, and then they would go across, cross uh, the, uh, the plateau, this is a very high plateau, go from uh, Foggia, Puglia, uh, to um, Ariano, and then uh, my village, Avellino, and then Naples. And that was the, the source uh, for supplies that the Germans used, and later on the Americans themselves used. Same road. Yes. Was it possible for your father to be in touch with you no. during these times? So Never. He was just out of control of your family. We, we had no yeah. co communications whatsoever between my uh, half of the family in America and ourselves. We, l we lived without any contact whatsoever. Came a day when you heard that Benito Mussolini had been hanged and killed in Milano. I guess it was in, up yes. in Milano. Yes. Uh, what did you think of that? Well. Uh, again, um, you, you have to understand how little we had to know anything. We didn't have a newspaper, we didn't have a, a radio, we didn't have electricity where I, where I was. So all of the things that were happening outside, we really didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And we did not know, at least I did not know, that Mussolini had been killed until much later because we didn't have the, uh, the source for uh, the information. Uh, but we did learn that he was killed, and, and, um, and you know, the uh, Italians, same as any other people, when uh, they see that, that, that something that was wrong has finally been righted, uh, do um, have a certain amount of jubilation. And I do remember that when we learned about it, it says, we said, well, he deserved it. And Italy left the war, you know, they, they left the war, but the Germans wouldn't really let them, is what well, happened historically. When the Germans were in my village, the armistice, Italy had already signed an armistice. Yeah. So Italy was already on the side of the Allies, except that we never saw any, any of the uh, military units uh, that, the, that Italy had. We only saw the German soldiers, and the German soldiers, as I described them, uh, were Exactly that, except that when the Americans landed in Salerno and started the, the land campaign, and so now we have the infantry units that they were moving from the Naples areas going east, um, the Germans fled before them. And the Germans that fled before them, though these were uh, the uh, infantry, I'm sure, they're the ones who came uh, into the village, and they're the only ones who really abused the, the villagers because they took whatever uh, they, they needed. They took everything that they needed, and then um, in many ways uh, did, um, uh, did not handle us in a, very, in a very nice way. Although we are alive, they didn't shoot us, but short of uh, killing us, they uh, did take advantage <coughs> of, the, of the villagers. And that's the only time that I saw them uh, really um, mistreat us. Other time, they simply didn't, they acted as though we weren't even uh, there. Didn't there come a point when uh, the American troops would have pushed all the Germans out of your area? 
Yes, so they did. You were, you were then dealing with the Americans? Yes, and so I remember the first battles. But I'd like to just describe to you one other uh, piece of, um, um, of evidence that I, that, that I saw that I think may be of interest to you. That as a boy, I, I followed all of the, the battles in the air. And we were attacked many times because the German were in front, were on the highway. They were stopped. And um, they also had anti-aircraft uh, guns. And, and, um, and in this particular battle, where the, uh, the Allies, the Americans, and the English were dropping bombs on this column, they were dropping bombs on my village. But I decided that I wanted to watch the whole battle. So I, would, I stood on one uh, part of the road where there was a big culvert, a small bridge, and, uh, and said, well, I, I wanted to watch it, and I did. But I also uh, was smart enough to think and believe that if the, uh, the, uh, they were going to bomb me directly where I was, I would go onto the bridge and take refuge, and therefore I would have survived. So that it, I wasn't just out there looking to, um, to see things. But what I saw was the German anti-aircraft units always have aim at the, at the planes, the planes that were dropping bombs and never once took one shot at the planes, even though they could have shot them down. Why was that? And I always wondered why. Were they was out of because, ammunition? No, they, no. They, everything was loaded, and they, were, and they followed, followed the, um, the planes. These were bombers who came down, and uh, um, I don't know how many bombs they um, they uh, came down, but the German soldiers who manned the uh, the uh, these guns, these powerful guns, there were four barrels. I still remember. Uh, they never shot, made one shot, and I guess I believe that either it was fear, or else they believed that if they did, then they would have shown their position, and then they would have drawn fire upon themselves. In any event, I'm glad they didn't do anything because I'm here telling the story, whereas. If they had drawn fire uh, because they would have shown their position, Goodbye. I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> Goodbye, Adolfo. <laughs> uh, the, second, uh, the second part is when the Americans came, when we saw the Americans for the first time. The Americans came, it was an infantry unit, I think um, a couple of platoons came up the road. And they uh, engaged the Germans for the first time in, fr in front of our eyes. And they uh, shot down, they shot two soldiers, two German soldiers, the rest dispersed throughout. Uh, and then they marched in, in, um, in uniform uh, on the street, on the, on the road in front of my village. And the difference between how the Germans had marched or gone through my village on the road and the Americans was a whole world of difference. We, the Americans were different. They were, they were smiling. They were throwing candies at us. They were uh, joking. They were, they were horse playing. They were, it was just an entirely different experience. Two opposite experiences. One, as I said, didn't seem as though they were human beings. And the other ones, they were noisy as could be and yelling. And yes, they were also kissing the girls. And the girls were going out and kissing them. They were, and flowers were being given. It was just a an entire, entirely different experience. You felt then, even though Italy had been in the war, uh, you guys were liberated by the Americans. Oh, absolutely. We were liberated. The Americans liberated us. And we were very thankful and grateful. And thereafter, we did not see any more war, henceforth. What we saw, however, were, um, soldiers, allied soldiers, who made my village their encampment for R&R, &R, rest and recreation. Because as the, um, the forces moved northward, uh, they would then be, uh, and, uh, be engaged in various battles, specifically Monte Cassino. Okay. They would, because they stayed there for many, many months, well, the soldiers who were there to fight at Monte Cassino, they were set back for rest and recreation in my village. Yeah, they'd get off the line and come down and right. rest. Right. Yeah. And so we had uh, <coughs> uh, 
soldiers who were Moroccans, who were um, Americans. I saw uh, black soldiers for the first time at, at that time. Um, also Japanese soldiers. Japanese and, Americans. Yes, yeah. Japanese Americans. Yeah. And um, as well as Polish. So people that spoke different languages did uh, come back um, there. And the thing that I remember that has stood in my mind is that I would become friends with some of the soldiers because they'd be there for a week or so. And I would always engage them in, in I don't know why, but in talking with them, I was always curious about what they, they were doing. And I would ask them questions, even though we had a difficult time c communicating because I spoke in dialect and, and I don't know how much we understood of each other. But the thing that I remember is that when they would come back the second time, the same soldiers would not be back. One or two may be back, but the others would not come back, meaning that they were killed um, at, at the front. You're getting along to be an old guy of about eight years old now. Yes. And the war has left your area. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, it ends. Uh, yes. Where were you when the war ended? Still well, in your village? Well, I was in my, in my village we, <clears throat> with my mother and, and sister. Um, we were trying to hold things together. We were, uh, again, uh, surviving, but life was, um, was better. And she still hadn't heard from your father? No, no. We, we heard from him. Uh, we heard from my, actually not from my father. We heard from my, my brother for the first time. Uh, because my brother had been inducted in the army, in the American army, and he had been sent overseas. And uh, of course, we didn't know any, any of this. It was quite a surprise, actually, when we learned about it. My, my brother had um, uh, finished the Battle of the Bulge. He was, he was there, by the way, and I'm happy to say that he uh, won a Bronze Star for heroism. Um, and he was about to go back to America when he was, uh, the, he was told that there weren't enough ships to bring the soldiers now back to the, to the States. And what did they want to do because they had something like 15 or 30 days uh, available to themselves. And he was asked, he asked to, um, for a leave of absence to go and visit his mother and me. And, you, and so my mother, my, fa my brother, Chris, who lives in Watertown, uh, came to my village and I saw him for the first time um, ever. And so that's the only time that we actually heard from my, uh, my other part of the family. Now he had written to us or anything, he couldn't have uh, in any event. So that when he came and it was in the evening. Tell us about the day. He shows up and you realize that this American soldier is your brother. Yes, well, I, he, he, he uh, asked where we were, I, I guess, when he uh, dro was dropped off of an American truck and he, and he had a, a duffel bag uh, with him. And I remember when he came over, he's, he's a, not a very tall man either, uh, with a, this duffel bag he, he came by and, and my mother, we all looked at him and said, no, what is this? We, you know, the Americans had gone by that time. We, we weren't seeing any of them. And, um, and here is my mother that recognizes him. Um, this is 1945. The, this is uh, 45. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the month, but it must have been probably. Well, after uh, the bulge, uh, yeah. this is early 45, the yeah. spring of 40, 45. Yeah. So, um, well, of course, we were all thrilled. Uh, we were uh, crying. I mean, it was. Uh, an unbelievable thing to have this, this well, situation. Did he just walk up and say, yes. hi? I'm, he just uh, walked up. Yeah. He, I mean, unexpectedly, we were, I think we were about to have some kind of supper when, when uh, the soldier came up to us and, and uh, my mother uh, was startled and then she recognized that, that uh, Chris was her son. What kind of message did he bring from your father? None. <laughs> None. He had your just father, survived. <laughs> your father was a very quiet man. <laughs> <laughs> he had just survived the war. I mean, a huge big battle, and now he was coming there. Um, we had no, um, at least no communications after all. I was a boy. I wasn't really 
old enough or sophisticated enough to, to know what messages or communications there was between my mother and, um, and my older uh, siblings. Okay. Before he left you, was there any understanding in the family that you were all going to get together or? Oh, there was more than an understanding. The, paper, the paperwork had already been uh, drawn up for uh, my mother, my sister, and me to come to, the, to America. So the paper, we were slated to, to come to America in 1939-40. So the paperwork was already there, the, the atto di richiamo, in other words, the, the calling papers had already been made and we were scheduled to, to uh, go to Naples and, and uh, go on board uh, the ship, either the Saturnia or Vulcania, and make the trip to America. But the war came out and, and uh, the shipping was, was uh, uh, shut down, so we were stranded in Italy. Still, you were a citizens of Italy. No. You well, I was a citizen of Italy, but a citizen of the United States, because when I was born, my father was an American citizen, so I had dual citizenship. I was an American. What about your mother? No. Okay, it's 1945 and your brother left eventually. He had obligations with the U.S. Army. Yes, and that's when, w that's when my brother told us that the paperwork hadn't been done and that soon after the war, the, the paperwork would be uh, um, renovated and that we would be uh, joining him and my father and my sisters in America. What kind of government existed in Italy in 1945? That, that is to say, was there a, an active government you could deal with to get these papers processed? Yes, they, uh, well, th there, were, th there was a, mu a municipality. Was it the Municipio. U.S. military government you were dealing but with? We dealt with the American consulate in Naples. Okay. And that was established. And uh, we had, uh, because I was an American citizen, uh, certainly I had certain privileges more than others. So we had no problem whatsoever getting the appropriate paperwork uh, to come to America. And I did come to America on an, on an American passport. My mother came and, to and America on an Italian passport. Was it 45? Uh, 1947. 47? Yeah. Yeah, we came uh, in 1947, in May of 1947, on the uh, ship called Saturnia, which is a, was a, a, a pre-war ship, a very large ship. And, uh, and I, we landed in uh, in New York, and that's where I saw my father and my sisters and my brother again, and, and all of that. You a, sailed into you, New York. Yes. Saw the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Saw the skyline, which yes. was quite impressive at, yes. in those days. What were your thoughts and your mother's? And, and uh, did, did people still go to Ellis Island in those days? No, no, we did not. We um, first of all, my first impression of um, getting into the harbor was all, all of these cars on the highway to the, to the left of it. Uh, and I said to myself, look at all those cars. We'd never seen that many cars. Oh, and New they were all the same size. That's <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, they were all the same size. They're all going yeah. very fast on this, this highway. What's going on? I'd never, I'd never seen uh, so much discipline that probably that's what, what struck me because there were uh, thousands of cars going back, back and forth in their lane, and there was discipline. Remember now, I had just come from Naples, and the traffic in Naples is absolutely astounding. <laughs> well, in Naples, they drive with one hand on the horn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on top of it, that is true. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said, oh, look at that. And then, of course, the Statue of Liberty was quite impressive. And we did feel that we had come to a land that offered us hope. Uh, and because we already knew of our other um, friends and, and as well as relatives that had come here, uh, we knew that it was going to be hard and difficult at first. But then if we stayed and worked at it, that we would have a, uh, a ground on which to work from, and we did. So it was really a land of hope, and we felt that when we came. And I still feel it now. Were you all together now, finally, as a family? Yes, and the, yeah. there's another side story to this, because 
When we came in 1947, my sister, who had lived with, with us during the war, she got married. And because she got married, she lost her right to come to America. And so my sister and brother-in-law and their child had to stay in Italy when we came. But because of uh, laws, we were not able to take together to come to America because the Im immigration laws had changed. And she was no longer, she, well, she was an adult, uh, no longer a dependent of, uh, of us, of my mm -hmm. father and mother. So what, what they did is they went to Argentina and, uh, and so they established a livelihood in Argentina. And then uh, my brother-in-law, his name is Al Capone, and I call him the real Al Capone, the wonderful Al Capone. That's nice. Yes. Visited us uh, in Boston, saw what Boston was like, saw what our family was like. And because my mother, again, my mother is the key to, to this whole thing, because my mother always wanted the family together. And she always desired that and fought for it, so that when my brother-in-law came, the message was, we want everybody here. And sure enough, we were able to call them from Argentina to come here. They came here and uh, made a huge success of themselves because they established various food stores in Boston. And as a matter of fact, Al Capone is still known today in the North End as having had the best uh, grocery stores. Uh, in, in all of Boston. And prohibition was over, so he made out very well. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily he did deal in liquor, <laughs> he dealt with food. So we finally all joined together, and that was the happiest day for my mother, and really for, uh, for all of us, because she, she wanted to have two things, two goals. One, that the family be together and, and be successful, and two, that each one of us would have our own homes, our own houses. See, and and, um, and then, of course, we exceeded all of her <coughs> dreams and desires because uh, we became professionals, uh, most of us. I, of course, was, uh, uh, went into the Army, I went to, uh, uh, to college, and I had her pin my first bars when, I, when that was given uh, uh, to me. How did it's you make up the five years you had lost in, in Italy? You went to the first grade. Yes. You went to the sixth grade when you yes. came to the States. Yes. Then you went to college. Yes. Where did you get educated? Uh, in Watertown. Uh, I went to the sixth grade in Watertown. It was really a wonderful first year. Mind you now, I didn't know uh, English, but I did not know Italian either because we spoke dialect at, uh, at home. And so I knew my local dialect. I didn't even know Neapolitan dialect, which is a dominant language in that region. Uh, but for some reason, the teachers were good, very, very good to me. I was very healthy. Um, I was always very eager to learn and open to um, all kinds of, of, ex of experiences. And I got along well with um, my newly American friends who put up with me because I didn't quite understand um, uh, English. But um, I remember in the sixth grade, I, of course, I didn't know math. I knew the metric system because it was based on 100 units. But when the Americans gave me fractions, one-fifth and one-quarter and seven-eighths and three-whatever, three-eighths, I could never fathom them. I said, what is the matter with you people? And yet you had the, uh, the monetary system that is based on the, on, the, on the metric system, you know, one to a hundred, whatever. And yet you came up with all this, this stuff. I could never really understand it. And so that became the weakness of uh, my background, is my inability to understand fractions. So you became a banker. Is that <laughs> <laughs> but this, uh, this um, I still remember my teacher, Miss Temple, had this other boy help me with uh, fractions. And he was Chinese, a Chinese-American boy that uh, we would stand aside and, and he would try to teach me. I must admit that the attempt was quite futile because I'm never able to understand them. Good for you. But <laughs> in the class, they, they were um, encyclopedias. So while I could not understand what was going on, I would go through the encyclopedia and I would learn by looking at the, at the, at the pictures. And also because I was in a class where English was spoken, 
This immersion helped me learn uh, English in a very fast way. So I did do the sixth grade, and then I, I was um, uh, placed in the seventh grade. And I don't know if, if now I may be bragging. That's why I, I loathe to, to describe this. But it is true that this happened to me, that my teachers in the seventh grade uh, were so taken up with me because I did my homework on a regular basis. And I got A's across the, um, on all my subjects. So much so that they decided to put me into the eighth grade because I was two years be behind, two years below a grade level. And the rest is actually history. High school in Watertown? High school Watertown. And what? Nor Northeastern University. Northeastern, and yeah. what, did, what did you major? I majored in, in languages, but they, they didn't have <coughs> Italian, so I majored in French and Spanish, and also in history as well as English. So I had. Um, minors in, in, in all of them. But Northeastern University was a co-op school, but I decided not to um, go on co-op. I decided to take it on straight. And so I completed my um, four-year degree in three and a half years. How did you get involved in the United States Army? I took ROTC and did in this Signal, Signal Corps ROTC at Northeastern University. To you? Did you decide you wanted to be yeah. a professional soldier? Yes. What did your family think about that? Well, not too many thoughts. My father, after all, had only gone through the third grade, and he spoke a certain amount of English, not, not too much. It, I just did it on my own. For some reason, I followed whatever instinct there was in me and, and just did it. I just felt that I knew that I was going to go in, into the Army because the draft was uh, active at that time. And so my question must have been, do I want to go in as a soldier or do I want to go in as an, as an officer? And so I took ROTC, enjoyed it very much, was very successful with it. It allowed me to also make some money because it did, um, I, I did make um, very little money. And uh, it allowed me also to, to travel. For instance, I went to Georgia. I mean, that was the longest distance that I ever traveled since I crossed the ocean from, tell, from Italy. Tell us, though, about uh Joining the United States Army, uh, where did you sign up? Where so w it was done in Boston, that graduation at Northeastern University. When I had my mother, I just needed to have my mother with me. And I asked her to, to pin my bars. She put them on the wrong lapel, by the way. <laughs> and then my sergeant, Sergeant Anderson, came it's, over and says, here, let me fix them it, for it you. It stunted your career. <laughs> <laughs> what year did you join the, the Army? Uh, well. That was in 1957. Now, I had come to America in 1947, and in 1957, I was a second lieutenant. And when I was asked, where did I want to go, I said, Italy. And they obliged, the Army obliged, and they sent me to Italy. Tell, first of all, let's go back to Georgia. What kind of training did you receive to become a second lieutenant? Well, what I had, was your specialty? Yes, I went to Georgia two times. The, the first time as a cadet. And as a cadet, you get ba basic training, even though I was in the Signal Corps. Was this Fort Benning? No, no, Georgia. Fort Gordon, Georgia. Okay. Yeah, which is a Signal outfit. And uh, there we had um, uh, basic training, and I must admit that that was the, the best training that I ever had. It was infantry for the most part, but it was bo bodybuilding, uh, and um, uh, it was very, very strong in every way. And I must admit that that training was formidable as far as uh, my makeup was concerned. That uh, it made me a very healthy, strong young man. That I, w I was able at that time to do all kinds of, of, of things. Uh, running, um, carry heavy loads. It was truly the best training that, that I had. Uh, and, and that was as a, as a cadet. And we were in, uh, in uh, units and platoons with uh, second lieutenants and first lieutenants who were our leaders at that time. So that was uh, in hot weather. Um, but certainly having accomplished that, that training at Fort Gordon, Georgia, really made us um, ready for just about anything. You, s you mentioned you were in a signal outfit. Signal Corps. And tell us what kind of training you got there beyond the infantry side of it? <clears throat> well, uh, the training was in uh, tactical communication systems. 
uh, not only radio, HF, but also UHF, um, uh, meaning uh, um, the, uh, the, the various frequencies that were used by uh, transmitters. In any event, it was tactical communication uh, system. Uh, our job was to establish communication systems with an advancing army. And, and it was quite, uh, quite extensive. So what, is what does that mean with an advancing army? It, meaning, it means that if you have a, uh, a unit, whether it's a, um, I don't know, a battalion or uh, a regiment, whatever, we would be, we would be the ones to establish the uh, network communication systems so that when they advanced, they would be able to talk with all their units. So we had telephone systems, we had radio systems, we had uh, uh, tele, we, uh, uh, teletype systems, we had uh, communication centers, in other words, the, the, the coding and the, the, the encoding of, um, of uh, messages that went back and forth, uh, all of those things. And at some point, somebody said to you, uh, we've sent you to school, you're an officer in the United States Army, where would you like to go? And you said Italy. Uh, yes. So you went home again, in a sense. I did. I did. Uh, it, it, that was truly amazing, except that this time I was sent to northern Italy. The, the, uh, there, was, there were um, uh, big centers in Verona, in Vicenza. And this was the time when um, the, uh, the rest of the military um, uh, forces were being brought uh, back to the States. So that when I got to Verona and then stationed in Vicenza in 1957, I still remember the um, many units, um, especially tank units, that came through Vicenza, went to Livorno or Leghorn, and, that, and then came to the States. And I still remember all the, all the tanks that had been used in battles were being brought back uh, and, and uh, shipped back to, uh, to, to the States. I looked you up on a map last night, and where you were stationed is roughly between Venice and Verona, just yes, roughly. exactly right. Had you ever been to Venice or Verona before? No, no. Had you ever heard of Romeo and Juliet before? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, but, but I, the, my having been there for um, uh, about four and a half years, stationed in Vicenza, it was a tremendous experience for me. It was really my formative experience uh, because not only did I have many responsibilities, it's hard to imagine that as a second lieutenant and as a first lieutenant, I had responsibilities not only of, of over 150 men at a time in, in my unit, that I was the, the, the leader, either the platoon, the platoon leader. Uh, but I al we also had in this task force, because ours was a task force that we were serving, we were, ser we were supplying communication systems to this task force. But this task force had many atomic warheads. And I, as a second lieutenant, was in charge of, of, of guarding these warheads. And we would we'd have silos and, and uh, tunnels. And um, many times, my job as a guard officer was to have my soldiers guard these, these uh, warheads. I mean, think of, of the kinds of responsibilities that were given us. And we fulfilled our responsibilities on a regular basis without ever a hitch. Just as I think back now, I said, oh my God. All I can uh, say is I hope so. <laughs> well, obviously it worked. <laughs> it, if it you worked. had lost one of those, you know, the oh. dealing in fractions wouldn't have done you any good. <laughs> yes, yes. And this is also the, um, again, because I spoke Italian, um, I, I was an asset to the entire um, American force in Vicenza because they asked me to be the, the interpreter and translator. Besides doing my regular job as a signal officer with the tactical communication systems, uh, I was also asked to do other things such as translate and, um, and interpret. But I was also given an additional task which, which was to do a reconnaissance 
of the Dolomites. The, this is now the, the mountains, that which are part of the Alps. They go from the east to the west. They go from Yugoslavia, um, between Austria and Italy, all the way over to the Alps that meet, of course, uh, France uh, on the left side. And, and because I knew Italian, my job was against to, to find relay sites for communications reasons, satellites and, and other um, relay uh, systems. And, and I'm happy to say that I, therefore, enjoyed having a helicopter practically assigned to me with a pilot. And I would go and simply fly uh, across uh, northern Italy from east to west and, um, and established relay sites between the northern forces, American forces, which were in Germany, and the Italian forces, because we were the southeastern task force. Uh, roughly, are you operating on a line, let's say, um, south of Austria, south of Switzerland, without leaving northern Italy or bumping up against France? You're in the in roughly in that area. We were bumping up against Yugoslavia and Austria. Over, over on the east. On the east side. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned the word helicopter, and I don't know a date for an incident you had in a helicopter. Would you tell us about one ride you had one day? Yes, I, I like to. Um, uh, so my job was to find these sites. And my job was also to um, supply the sites, because they were my sites. In other words, they were under my, my jurisdiction. And I had a, um, a UHF radio uh, relay site established north of Belluno. Belluno is a, one of the, the uh, further north uh, large cities in, in Europe. And at Belluno, there are two huge mountains, two mountain peaks, that more or less look at each other. And I, uh, having uh, gone there by helicopter, we decided that this would be a very good place to set up uh, these radio uh, relay um, uh, uh, equipment. Except that there were no roads to go to it, and the uh, and the site had to be supplied, furnished and supplied by uh, using helicopters. And because the uh, the equipment required power, electrical power, we needed. The uh, generators called PE95s at the time. These were huge, very heavy uh, units that could not be um, brought over except by helicopter, not inside the helicopter, but through a sling uh, attachment at the bottom of the helicopter so that the, uh, uh, the power unit would actually be in the air uh, held by, uh, by um, uh, these cords. But what happened on one time, we were relieving the, um, the soldiers that were there and um, with new ones, and there were about 15 of us, myself, I was in charge, and my uh, platoon sergeants and all. That, but however, when the, um, the pilot came to drop the power unit, he must have made a mistaken judgment because the power unit was probably too heavy. He lost his revolutions, the RPM, and he was not able to hold the helicopter in place. So he had to make, in a split decision, he dropped the, the power unit from way up high with the hope of being able to gain his revolution so that the, he would be able to maintain uh, the helicopter in flight. Uh, but as he tried, the, uh, the helicopter swerved to one side, and before we knew it, um, we hit the side of the mountain. And we, of course, we were all inside the, the, the helicopter, and uh, all the mermite cans and everything else start fl uh, flying about. One came to me, and my good sergeant put his uh, arm out to deflate it, and as a matter of fact, uh, it did deflate. And uh, we were crushing and, and uh, going down on the side of the mountain. We were, obviously, we heard the noise. And then finally, we came to a stop. And we immediately all got out. And when we got out, there was gas flying all over the place, except that we landed on, on snow. There was a, a, a culvert full of snow. 
And that, uh, that absorbed, um, uh, I think, the impact. And so we were able to get out. We all got out, and except for uh, the sergeant who got his wrist uh, hurt. He, but nobody else no, got hurt? Nobody got hurt, including the, um, uh, the pilot. And I said to myself, here, um, during the war I was in Italy and I was bombed at and machine gunned at and everything, and both from the air and from the ground, and nothing ever happened to me. And now uh, here I come back to Italy in a, in a military unit and I'm practically dying, and, but I'm not. And I, said, what, and I consider that a miracle that, that I actually was able to survive that particular um, incident. And didn't you have to go to somebody and say, by the way, I don't have that helicopter any longer? <laughs> no, or I the generator that you dropped from altitude? <laughs> As a matter of fact, the helicopter had to be cut up and, and taken off. Yeah. But we had, um, we had the, um, the option of going back to base to, for medical attentions. But I'm happy to tell you that, that my unit and I decided to stay on, on the, uh, and fulfill our duty. So we stayed there on, and, and then we moved, were moved back on several days thereafter. I'm very pr proud of that, the fact that we could have taken the easy way out, but we decided to fulfill our um, mission at that time, which was to man that particular site for that many days, and we stayed there, uh, whereas we could have gone back uh, to base. I didn't want to skip over your use of atomic warheads before, or the, your care of them. Um, I was not aware of the fact that the U.S. Army had atomic weapons in northern Italy at that time. We did. Uh, was this rather well known? Well, uh, I don't know if it, were, if it um, was known outside. I would assume that it was known outside. Uh, I'm sure that it was known also by um, by the Italians uh, there. Um, I'm sure there was not a secret because the task force was made up of uh, certain units, including our artillery units, that had atomic uh, capabilities. If anything, I would, I would say that it, it must have been a fairly well-known fact because probably we, we wanted it to be known because it would have acted as a deterrent, which it did. Were these in silos, and, and were they aimed at Russia? Well, they were, the, the, the warheads were probably uh, artillery, which means that they were not in silos. No, we did not have any missiles, if that's what you mean. We did have, however, our, um, um, we had rocket launchers, but we had, uh, we, we had, um, one artillery unit that was able to launch uh, atomic okay. warheads. Okay, this, you, these are not intercontinental then? No. Okay. No, they were, remember, we were fulfilling tactical needs. So it meant land, land, um, uh, land exercises. I didn't ask you something uh, initially. When you joined the United States Army, under what conditions? For how long? Would you, for four years? Two years. Two years. Two years. So obviously you've shipped over a couple of times here. So I, w I went in for two years and I was stationed in, um, in Italy, in Vicenza, and then went to Roma where I went to see Romeo and Juliet Good. and all the, the, uh, the cultural uh, part and Venice yeah. and all the rest. That, and I met my future wife uh, in there uh, and got married and had my first child uh, in Italy while I was stationed there. So because of that, I extended for another two and a half years. So I spent almost five years in Italy uh, as a uh, second lieutenant and then yeah, as first a first lieutenant. lieutenant. Then we came back, we were sent back to Georgia where I made, at Fort Gordon again, where I made captain. And then uh, at that time, I decided to leave the active uh, army and uh, I joined uh, the, the reserves. And I spent the, the remaining uh, time in the reserves with a total of 30 years of uh, between active and reserve time. 
And with what rank did you leave the reserves? And I left the reserves with the uh, colonel. I was very happy to, every time uh, that I made my promotions on a regular basis. And so I left uh, as a uh, colonel and also as a brigade commander uh, in, the, in the reserve. So um, I had some wonderful experiences. In the reserves also I spent uh, several uh, tours of duties at the Pentagon uh, as well as uh, elsewhere doing studies specifically. I should think uh, your mother looking at you and, and your career and what you did must have been extremely proud of you. Oh, uh, well, there's no, no doubt about it. My mother was the, well, I was her idol, of course. Um, but uh, she loved all of us. But I, I think that I'm the one who probably, um, well, got out more. Obviously, I did. And, and I did more. Uh, and I'm also an author. I, I, we haven't said anything about this. But I have published, written 15 books and published 15 books uh, for the most part on the relationship between Italy and the United States, but mainly in the United States. And so um, I've made um, many appearances also as an author. And my mother was always uh, extremely happy and, and, uh, and proud, I mean, of her son, after all. Uh, he is one who. <laughs> you were a dropout from the first grade. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, yeah. and uh, so it, it was really, uh, and it is nice. We have such a wonderful um, relationship in my family, with my brothers and sisters. That because of all this experience, we, we're very, very close, and we, we like each other. This is an amazing thing. Let's go back a little bit to your time in the reserves. You spent... Uh, 25 years in the yes, reserves, just about, something yes. like that. Tell us about what you saw change from the time you were a shave tail till you were a colonel, a full bird yes. colonel. Um, you must have seen great technical differences in in uh, what you, the material you dealt with, and the things that you did in in the army, including your reserve time. The um, the time that was crucial for me in the reserves was in the 60s and, and early 70s. Now this was during, the, during Vietnam. And the unit at that time was, we, I was in a, what was called a civil affairs unit. And, and uh, the civil affairs uh, unit, its job was to have area studies about certain parts of the world. And our jobs was to look, get as much information of all kinds, because if we were to be deployed in those parts of the world, we would be using this information to give to the, uh, to the forces, to the armed forces, as well as to others, so that we would know what to expect. So my, my job, or our jobs, was to do that. But during that time, during Vietnam, our unit were, units were always filled. There were more, more lawyers and, and more teachers and more professionals in, uh, in those slots than ever because they, it helped them from having to be called on active duty or to, be, or to go to, uh, uh, to Vietnam. And obviously our unit or my unit um, was never called but it was on, always online to be called. Luckily, we were not called. But if we had uh, been called, we would have gone uh, there. But the, the thing that I remember of distinction, because afterwards we had the, uh, the war demonstrations going on at the same time that we were trying to make the best um, possible with our lives. And the thing that always bothered me, and still does, I must admit, that it has not gone away, is how foolish America was not to really have stuck together and seen the war through the way that we should have. Um, I have actually quite a resentment uh, about, about that, because here we were striving 
not to lose sight of, of one fact, and the fact was that no matter how bad Vietnam was and Korea was, we felt, and I felt, that there was a threat to the world, and the threat was the, domin the domination of communist Russia and eventually China. See, I believe that, and I still believe it now, that <clears throat> that war was important, if for no other reason, to stop this expansion, because we had made analysis of many parts of the world at that time. Remember, we were doing studies, area studies, and we saw where communist regimes had been set up all over Africa, practically all of Africa was, was already taken over by uh, communist regimes, even to the point that Cuba sent its own forces into Africa. And we saw the attempt on a regular basis uh, all over the world where this was happening. And so with this information, at least I concluded that America had to do what it did, fighting this awful, dirty war, because if we succeeded in at least holding or stopping this expansion, the whole world would have gained from it. So we had to also, also say you cannot be demonstrating against perhaps a, a tactics that we used that, that was right or wrong or that we were giving uh, information that may have been wrong as far as, for instance, numbers, how many people got killed or who did this or that. The, the overall issue was to stop this expansion. And I think that we did do that at tremendous sacrifices, but the sacrifices were much greater than if we hadn't acted the way that we did. Because I feel and believe that we extended the war and that we created more victims as a result of it. Um, and therefore, the goal that we had to achieve, we achieved it on behalf of the whole world, but at tremendous sacrifices because we simply did not behave the way that I feel that we should have behaved. And so that part of um, my experience in the, in the reserves was a, a part that affected my psyche very deeply, I feel. And, and it's something that I carry on today. I'm here, I'm telling you about it. Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, when a lot of this was going on, um, has 30 years after the fact disavowed uh, the domino theory, yes. said it in his view now, it probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, how do you square that with your feelings about Well, I this? certainly did not square it with him. I thought that he is the one who used the wrong tactics to begin with, and he was res re responsible for the manner in which the war was conducted. He tried to conduct the war, and actually conducted the war, using computers uh, here in Washington, D.C., and um, it's the, the first time where the, our politicians uh, really screwed up because they, they were uh, involving themselves in tactical decisions. Um, and they actually did um, constrain us to a great degree. I really uh, see the image, the, the metaphor of the American soldier going into battle with one arm literally tied behind his back. I really do see that. But McNamara, uh, as far as I'm concerned, misconceived uh, the whole thing. Um, he is the one that wanted reports and so on and so forth. And, and I hold him responsible for the way that the war was, uh, was conducted. And I think he screwed up. He didn't understand the overall uh, issue of the war, why we were there and all that. And, and, and he is the one who should be ashamed of, him, of himself, even today. And when he came out with his disavowal and all, uh, I, f I felt uh, an anger that was quite huge. A lot of people that were stunned when that book yes. came out. You had a long, good career, and uh, you've started it as few people do who have sat in that chair there. You started c telling us things that happened to you when you were five, six, seven years old. That's pretty rare for this session, and we're, we're very <laughs> pleased that you did that. 
I wonder if covering that much ground, you can tell us where, is there one most memorable experience that stood out in, in, in that whole 30, 40 years of your life that you were telling, telling us about? During the time of, the, um, of my experience with you, the military? You pick one that we'd like to hear about. <laughs> I don't know, there were so many of them. Uh, but it's hard for me to, to focus on any one of them. The, I, I don't know, perhaps the end of the uh, Vietnam War, I thought that to be a godsend because I wanted to, to end long before. Um, and it didn't and it just went on. So that when the Vietnam War ended, I felt a great satisfaction and a great relief because not only did it affect me personally in that I did not go, although I would have gone, but it meant something different for the United States and, and for the world. And it really did, it proved to be that, because as a result of the end of that war, we more or less got stabilized. America came to peace again, to terms with it. Uh, the Americans came to terms with each other. Um, and we had a new, at the birth of practically of a new renaissance, uh, in America. So I saw that as a something that to stabilize the world, it stabilized America, and we were able to accomplish great, great things, as we did. We went to the moon, we did all the kinds of things, the computers and all, and it's all because of having ended that particular tragic war that we had. So that to me is the highlight because I saw it as being m meaningful, not only for individuals, Americans, but people from throughout the world. That's a very positive view. Uh, over the same period of time, is there one person who stood out, a most memorable character in your military career that every once in a while you think about that person. Could you tell us that? Yes, I, I uh, think of, um, he is now Colonel B Burns, George Burns. He is the one who uh, was my, my uh, co company commander and I was a platoon leader in his unit, in his company, the 124th Signal Company. I would say that George Burns is the one who, uh, who helped me a great deal because under his leadership, I was growing up. I was really learning. And he is the one who had two things going for himself, and therefore those attributes reverted on to, to us or to me. And that he, he was very proficient and efficient and demanded complete training and readiness, both physically and mentally. So we trained very well. At the same time, however, he, he had a heart. He understood the limits that we all had. And he pushed us to the limits, but never beyond the limits. So he showed to have leadership capabilities that I respect. And I've used that, those attributes in my own life, in, in, um, in um, using them so that you do things that are within your reach and do them well. And if you cannot, if things are not without, within your reach, then you just leave it alone until you can reach them. So it show, it, he taught me discipline. The other individual that impacted on me was Sergeant, Sergeant Jessup. He was a, uh, a black soldier, um, and he was under my command. He was, uh, because I was the platoon leader, and he was my, my platoon sergeant. And what I learned from him, again, was a, a different kind of, of leadership. Now, this was leadership from, from below, how he handled the soldiers, how he handled all kinds of, of uh, situations, and how he, he was very quiet. He just went along um, doing his business. But the thing that I remember is that the soldiers would always show a certain amount of respect for him, even though he did not demand it, because his demand were in different done in a different way. And so those were the two soldiers, one a captain, the other one a, a sergeant, 
that I remember as, ha as having impacted on me in my, own, in my formation, towards my own formation. And I always think of, of them and I apply or try to apply those lessons that I learned from them in my life, whether I'd be an officer in the Army or simply as, as a teacher or as a human being. You haven't told us a single most humorous experience. Is there some time you could look back on um, <laughs> other than standing at, at a culvert thinking you're going to dive into it and be safe? Is there something really funny that happened well, to you over those yes, years? Yes, there, there, there were uh, many, many obviously uh, funny things uh, that happened. Um, at one time, again, because of the fact that I did not know much English, uh, or I was learning it, um, we were giving a, a test, and one of the tests was to uh, see if we could learn, uh, for instance, A for alpha, B for, uh, in other words, that, uh, that system of calling out um, um, the words to go with the letters, because we were in the signal core. And then it came to me, this was a, a, a test for the whole unit, and so the letter would be, would be called out and we would have to give the, um, the, the word. And it came to me that it was, I was given the word for V, for Victor. And so the guy came, and, 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 but I thought that I was going to be giving the, the letter W. And so Cadet Queso, V. And because I thought it was going to be W, I said, whiskey. <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> and the whole, I mean, the, everyone just, just it, I mean, everything, every, everything stopped because there was an uproar of laughter all over the place. <laughs> because I was thinking ahead, and I had <laughs> predicted that it was Victor instead of, of the W for. You were thinking of your <laughs> son-in-law or brother-in-law, yes. Al Capone. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. How important totally in your life to you was serving in the military? I would say total because uh, first of all I, I succeeded with it. I uh, met so many people and did so many things uh, with the Army. The Army allowed, it, allowed for the world to be made available to me. And and um, and I found a, uh, that the army was extremely good. I, the uh, the American military is is really a wonderful organization, that it allowed me a, a a non an American that was not born here, to be able to access uh, its entire thing. Remember, I had top secret uh, uh, clearance because of the signal work that I was doing. And I, and I worked at the, at the Pentagon. I worked all over the place. Um, the Army, total experience, we used to call it the total Army at that time, but, but the total Army had a total impact on my life. And I've been uh, very grateful and extremely proud for having served, and I'm ready to serve again. Adolfo, we're almost through. Is there anything I haven't asked you here this morning that you think you'd like to add to this tape for your family to see or for historians later on down the line? Well, the thing that I'm enjoying uh, presently are two things. One is the life that I'm having with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I see them on a regular basis and to see them that they're growing up so uh, wonderful. I have two of them here in Natick uh, living close to this uh, library. Uh, my two grandchildren here, I have three grandchildren that live close by in Weston. I have one, however, that I do not see, and this I, I regret, regret not seeing because she lives in Monte Carlo in, in Europe, and so I don't see her as often. Okay. Let's just hold it a second here. We have a very good fire department here. <laughs> <laughs> they test their sirens every time we run a tape here. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were in That's Monte right. Carlo. Yeah, so um, I do not see that grandchild as often as I would like to see, but I'm enjoying this aspect of uh, being with my grandchildren. They're ready, and, and, um, and I'm growing up with them. 
So it, it's a great feeling. The second thing is that I am trying to uh, found that which will hopefully will be the first Italian-American sponsored university in the United States. Um, I know there are so many universities, but nevertheless, we have this goal, uh, I've had this dream, and we have established a foundation called the Dante University of America Foundation. Uh, so we are incorporated. We received our tax ex exemption numbers from the federal as well as the state. And so we are now running programs in order to, to establish this digital university because the university will function at the internet level. So those are my two things. I hope you make it. Thank you I very thank much. Thank you very for much. In. Yes. Thank you. Thanks.